I want to talk to you this morning on the subject of the setup. Somebody say the setup. Everybody in here knows the story about the tortoise and the hare, right? Everybody knows that logically the tort or the hare or the rabbit's supposed to win the race, right? But I want to talk to you this morning about the setup. Somebody say the setup. Yeah. Say, get ready for the setup. Turn to your neighbor and say, get ready for the setup. Turn to the other and say, get ready for the setup. Now, a, a lot of times, let me clarify something. A lot of times when we think of the phrase, the setup, we think of it in a, in a negative sense. Well, we're not talking about the negative sense this morning. We're talking about the setup in a positive sense this morning. Somebody say the setup. How many of you know God wants to set you up? God wants to set you up. God wants to position you. God wants to prepare you for great things in your life. Somebody say again, the setup. I've been set up many times before. You've been set up many times before. But I want you to know that some of you today are going through a time in your life, a season in your life that's not so good right now. You're going through some challenges in your life right now. You're going through some difficult times at this very moment. I just want you to know all it is is a setup. Right. It's just a setup. You may be discouraged. You may be weak. You may be confused, wondering why you're going through what you're going through. I've been there, done that. How many of you, God has spoken to you about something before, and then when it happens, you, okay, God spoke to you about something that's going to be a challenge for you. Anybody ever been, God has spoke to you about a challenge? Uh, uh, rough days coming? Now, you're expecting it, right? Oh, just in case you didn't know, God don't always tell us about good things coming our way. You know, the, the, it's the, the, the rain, it, it rains on the, on the just as well as the unjust. So we all face challenges. It'd be a wicked world if we didn't have challenges sometimes. It'd be an unrealistic world if we didn't have challenges sometimes. I believe it's those challenges that make you stronger. Those challenges that make you better those challenges that make you more like God. Now, without going any further, I've got to say this. Many teach, many preachers teach and believe that God puts you through mess. I'm going to tell you ahead of time, I don't believe it. People preach and teach that God puts you through mess to make you better. People teach and believe that God puts you through all kinds of, of, of horrible stuff, and, and he, he does that to make you strong. No, God doesn't put us through that. We go through that, but God can use that to make us bigger, to make us better, to make us stronger. Can I get a witness this morning? See, some of the mess that we go through, we do, but then some of the mess that we go through, the enemy does to us. But here's the third thing. Some of the mess that we go through is just simply because we live in a fallen world. But regardless of whatever it is, one, two, or three, God can use it to make you bigger, better, and stronger. The Bible says all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. But this morning we're going to talk about the setup. And I want to talk specifically to those of you that are going through some difficult times. Those of you that are going through a season in your life like you've never experienced before. This season has you questioning God. Anybody ever questioned God? Now, I realize as a kid, people say, never question God. And, and we may be a house divided this morning based upon what I'm going to say. But, but some of the older saints said, don't you question God. Anybody ever heard that? Don't you question God? How many of you ever said, don't you quit? Don't put your hands up. How many of you ever said, don't you question God? I want to challenge that with the word of God. The Bible says, if a man lacked wisdom, that word wisdom in the Greek language means if a man lacked under practical understanding, let him ask of God who give it to all men freely or liberally. So if I don't have the answer, who better to ask than God? Who better to ask than God? 
even when you're going through moments that you don't understand that you just don't like. Any, anybody ever going through something you just didn't understand and you just didn't, you didn't like it? Let me see your hand. We've all been there. We've all done that. Now, I'm not speaking negative over you, but if you hadn't been there, get ready. You're going to, I'm not going to say it loud because I don't want to scare y'all, so get ready. Because you're going to face some challenging times in your life. Jesus said, or, or, or Peter said, be sober, be vigilant, because the adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for folks to devour. Jesus said, be of good cheer. Or in this world, you should go through tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand this morning, but I know without a shadow of a doubt, some of you are going through a rough season in your life. Possibly a season you've never experienced before. Possibly a season that's got you questioning, God, why am I going through this? God, why am I here? Some of you are from a different state, different city. And God has led you to Fort Smith, Arkansas. <laughs> Some of y'all might be from Florida, the beach. And God sent you to Fort Smith where we are known for. Humidity. Let's go to Florida. But it really doesn't matter because, see, God is the God of Florida. He's the God of Fort Smith. He's the God of California. He's the God of New York. God can take anybody and put you in a, a, a not-so-pleasant place and cause you to do great things. See, you're in this season, but you're in the season for a setup. You're in the season for a setup. Jeremiah 29, 11, the Bible says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. The New Living Translation says, To give you an expected outcome. Please understand this. Your life is not going to always be a bed of roses. You're not going to always wake up on a Monday morning and want to do some cartwheels. You're not going to always, hey, listen to this. You may not feel like doing that on a Friday when you get paid either, but I'm just saying Here's the deal. We're going to go through some trying times in life. But if we're not careful, we'll get caught up in the circumstances and take our eyes off of what God really and truly wants to do in us, with us, and through us. I'm talking about the setup. Listen to this. Your setup is not automatic. Let's just go ahead and get that straight right now. Your setup is not automatic. It's based upon your obedience even when you don't fully understand, uh, even if you don't fully understand, nor it making sense. Some things just don't make sense. Now, let's take a step back. Has God ever put something on your heart? Now, let's just be real, okay? It's just us, just us in here. Has God ever put something on your heart or told you to do something that logically it just simply didn't make sense? It just simply didn't make sense. And you've been like, is that me thinking that or is that really God? Or you even say, God, are you sure about that? Like God ain't sure about what he said. Some things that God puts on your heart is not going to make sense. Why God positions you and repositions you is not going to make six, not going to make sense logically. But we can't think logically in order to be, to be able to figure out what God wants to do. In fact, we need to stop trying to figure out God Amen. and just trust that He is God and He knows what's best for us. But your setup is not automatic. It's based upon your obedience, even when you don't fully understand, nor it making sense. 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse number 5. So Elijah did as the Lord told him and camped beside Kareth Brook, east of the Jordan River. Let's stay right there. So Elijah, the prophet of God, the man of God. So Elijah did as the Lord told him. Simple, right? God told him to do something and he went and did it. 
End of story. Not so fast. Not so fast. God told him what needed to have been done, and then he went through some rough times. Then he went through some challenging times. Then he went through some difficult times. So Elijah did as the Lord told him. Now let's read the whole story. Um, 1 Kings chapter 17, and we'll start with verse number 1. 1 Kings 17, starting with verse number 1. Now Elijah, who was from Tishbe in Gilead, told King Ahab, Ahab was a wicked king that turned the children of Israel away from God, and they began to worship an idol god called Baal. Now Elijah, who was from Tishbe, in Gilead, told King Ahab, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years. Hold up, pause for just a minute. If you read the Gospel of Luke and James, you'll recognize what Elijah's talking about. It took three and a half years. There was no rain nor dew on the grass for three and a half years. God works in mysterious ways. God knows how to get our attention, doesn't he? Have you ever seen, a, 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 a and, and if you do this, nothing against it. Have you ever seen a parent, usually some mother, in, 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 in a public place, Walmart or wherever, and they've got a little kid with them, and they've got this little deal around their wrist, and it's attached to their wrist or across, on, on the belt buckle, and it's sort of like, a, I don't know what you call it, like I call it a chain. A leash, a leash. How many of y'all seen that? You, you, you see this kid about maybe five steps ahead of the mama, and the mama stops. I don't know if daddies just don't believe in it or what, but it's usually the mama that's got that. But anyhow, they're going, and that kid can only go so far, right? That leash is, uh, no, leash, is a leash? Yeah, whatever it is, that leash, <laughs> that just sounds funny. When I think of a leash, I think of you walking your, your, your kid, um, your, your, you know what I'm trying to say, your dog. Let me get back in the pulpit. <laughs> when you see that, they can only go so far. That's to protect that child. The mother, the father, whoever wants to protect their kids, right? God uses circumstances that are uncomfortable to us to protect us. We may not like it. There was a drought for three and a half years that would cause the children of Israel to return back to God. Now, listen, Elijah the prophet, he prophesied this. No rain, no dew for three and a half years. Don't you know the same drought that they were going through, Elijah was going to go through? Don't you know the things that died around him was also, or died around them was also going to die around him? Don't you know the challenging times that they dealt with because of this drought and their disobedience, not his? He was going to have to deal with the same things. Now, let me go back and read it again. Now, Elijah was from Tishbe and Gilead, told King Ahab, As surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. Then the Lord said to Elijah, next verse, Go to the east and hide by Kareth Brook, near where it enters the Jordan River. Drink from the brook. Drink from the brook. Now, this is, this is just, this blows my mind right here. He said, drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you. Somebody say raven. Eat what the ravens bring you, for I have commanded them to bring you food. Now, there's a drought. Everything's dying out, right? The animals are dying because they can't drink. They can't eat. The food is gone. But God says to the man of God, I want you to go by the brook and you get your water right there. And God says, Elijah, while you're by this brook, I'm going to command that the ravens bring you, the Bible says, King James says, flesh and bread in the morning and flesh and bread in the evening. Now, I've been scratching my head. Here's a little problem. Y'all know what a raven is? <laughs> Somebody said a scary bird. It's a carnivore. It's a meat eater, right? I'm also a meat eater. 
I love bacon. I love hamburgers. I love pork chops. I love steak. I, lo- I'm a, I love meat. If you don't like pork, that's between you and God. Give me yours. I, I realize I realize some people, you know, think, no, don't get me wrong, pork is, is, this is not the same. Some people be like, well, pork is not the best meat to eat, right? But some people don't eat it because of religious reasons. I better let that alone. <laughs> Here's the deal with that raven. The raven is a meat eater. So my thoughts are, if this raven gets a hold of some meat, don't you think that raven's going to eat that meat? Logically, instead of bringing that meat to me, that just don't sound right, does it? God's going to use a bird to send me some meat. See, we can't think of logic when it comes to God. We just got to trust Him. Sometimes God is going to say things and have you doing things that make absolutely no sense. But if God says it, we need to obey, right? If God says it, we need to do it. If you don't do it, you're going to miss your setup. See, some of you are in a season of your life that it makes absolutely no sense. Understand this. You are in a season for a setup. Can I get a witness this morning? Eat what the ravens bring you, for I've commanded them to bring you food. So Elijah did as the Lord told him and camped beside Kareth Brook, east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening, and he drank from the brook. Some of you guys are positioned for a setup. Some of you guys are sitting there scratching your heads and wondering, God, why am I here? God, what what in the world is going on? God, I just don't like this. God, I just don't, I don't understand this. God, how much longer? See, I'm not talking about out of your disobedience because sometimes when we're disobedient and we're, we're caught up in mess, you go through mess because you're doing stuff you haven't got no business doing. And we've all been there. But I'm talking about you acting in obedience to God. And it just doesn't make any sense. Here's what you cannot afford to do. You can't afford to quit. You can't afford to stop. You you, you can't afford to yield. You can't afford to back up. You can't afford to just turn around and stop doing what you know to be doing, which is the right thing. Because instead of receiving the setup, you receive disappointment. Somebody say, this is my time for the setup. The ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening, and he drank from the brook. Here's a question I've got for you. Everybody in the house needs to hear this. How do I walk in obedience in order to position myself for the setup? Hold up on that point. How do I walk in obedience in order to position myself for the setup? Everybody wants to be set up, right? We all want to be set up by God, don't we? How do I keep this this mind of mine from getting in the way of stuff and messing up my setup. Don't you know that your biggest enemy is not Satan? Preacher, you're going to have to explain that one. Your biggest enemy is not Satan. Your greatest enemy is not Satan. Your greatest enemy is not your past. Your greatest enemy is not people. Your greatest enemy, if we're not careful, is that thing between our ears, our thought process. The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Why do you think most people fail when God has set them up for victory? Why do you think Moses didn't make it into the promised land? Why do you think... Peter sank when God told him to come and walk on water. Because this right here got in the way. Fear and doubt and I can't and I'm less than, I'm not good enough. So what? When you're not good enough, God is. When you're weak, God is strong. 
when you don't have enough, El Shaddai steps in and you become more than enough. Can I get a witness this morning? Your greatest challenge will never be another person. Your greatest challenge will never be the defeated one. It will never be Satan because God has given us dominion over Satan. Your greatest challenge will be your thought process. What do you do when those thoughts come up? What do you do when the devil says, now listen, the devil says, but you don't have to listen. The devil says, but you don't have to believe. The devil says, but you don't have to walk in that. Well, pastor, I get fierce. I I become fearful. Who doesn't become fearful sometimes? Do you think I get up here and, and walk every day of my life and don't ever become fearful about things? Well, I'm the man of God. You're the man of God. You're not supposed to have fear. You're right. I'm not supposed to. For God, and people quote that scripture, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's right. But baby, we human. We're going to have fear. But fear shouldn't stop you. You're going to fail. You're not going to make it. You're not good enough. You're not qualified. You'll never overcome. You'll always be messed up. You'll always be broke. You'll always be this. You'll always be that. You'll never accomplish God's purpose for your life. Lie, 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 lie. How do you combat that? How do you, how do you come against that? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I will not stop. I will overcome. I will be delivered. I will be set free. They will overcome. They will be set free. I am healed with his stripes in Jesus' name. That mine, you've heard that that, that commercial, the mine is a terrible thing to waste. Are you wasting this morning? You're in that season for a setup, but the enemy wants you to set down. How do you walk in obedience or how do I walk in obedience and in order to position myself for the setup. Number one, focus on the process, not the circumstances. Focus on the process, not the circumstances. First Kings chapter 17, verse number two. Then the Lord said to Elijah, go to the east and hide by the Kareth brook. Near where it enters the Jordan River, drink, this is the process, drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you, for I have commanded them to bring you food. That's the process. The circumstances are the drought. The circumstances is vegetation and animals dying out because there's no water. What what is Elijah supposed to be doing? He's supposed to continue to walk around that mess, but focusing on the process the process isn't always easy either. Man, I, I think we've got a warped way of thinking sometimes because of what we've been taught. People say, give your life to Jesus and you have no more troubles. Give your life to Jesus, go to church every Sunday and all your troubles will go away. When you find that church, let me know. Because that's a lot. That's not realistic. That's not the way life is. That's why when people believe that, so many Christians fall to the wayside. So many Christians don't know how to battle because they hadn't been taught to battle. Oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Yeah, that's good. But you better understand some scripture. You better understand some word. You better learn how to talk to yourself. You better learn how to quote some scripture to yourself. You better be like King David that encouraged himself in the Lord because if you ain't got no word in you when the devil comes, how are you going to stand? Your faithfulness to church, if you ain't got no word in you, now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that you can't be a Christian. You can be a Christian and, and go to church every Sunday, and that's good. But going to church every Sunday for the attendance and, 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 and faithfully tithing, that's not good enough. That's why we have discipleship so we can go a little bit deeper in the Word of God. So when the storms of life that want to swallow you up have to back away because you got some Word in you. You guys remember in the Bible where, the, where Jesus had fast 40 days and 40 nights? 
And the Bible says afterwards he was hungry and the tempter came to him. Listen, you ain't got to go looking for trouble. Trouble will hunt you down. Trouble will come knocking on your door. You can be minding your own business and trouble will come finding you. How are you going to handle that, that trouble? When the devil, the Bible says, and, and, and Jesus was in the wilderness fast 40 days, 40 nights, he was hungry, and the tempter came to him. And the devil knew he was hungry. How many of you know the devil knows your problems? How many of you know the devil knows your weaknesses? Anybody got any weaknesses? Everybody got weaknesses. The person beside you, the person in front of you, the person preaching to you. Everybody has their weaknesses. If somebody ever tells you they ain't got no weaknesses, you just discover their weakness. They be lying. Everybody's got weaknesses, right? The devil came to Jesus and said, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. How many of you know Jesus had the power to do it? How many of you know he was probably tempted to do it? See, it's not a sin to be tempted. The Bible says that Jesus, our high priest, was tempted like as we are, yet without sin. It's not a sin to be tempted. We're all tempted in different ways. Sin comes in when we yield to that temptation. The devil says, if you are the son of God. How many of you know Jesus knew he was the son of God? But the devil says, if you. See, he wanted Jesus to question his identity. Satan wants you to, uh, to question your identity. And when you begin to question your identity, you don't know who you are. And when you don't know who you are, you don't know what you possess. See, the Bible says that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. See, my identity don't come through my mama and my daddy. That's how I got here. But my identity came through my relationship with Jesus Christ. See, everything that the father has, his son has. His son has. So Jesus said, for it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. What are you standing on in your dry season? You can't quit because you'll miss your setup if you don't quit. Can I get an amen? amen? Focus on the process, not the circumstances. I alluded to it earlier when Peter got out of the water. How many of you know when Jesus tells you something, you can count on it? They're out on this, they're out on this, they're out on, 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 this, on this river, out on the lake, and all of a sudden a storm brews up and they see what they believe to be a ghost. But it was Jesus walking on the sea. And they became fearful, and all of a sudden, Jesus told them, Don't be afraid, it's just me. And Peter in his boldness said, Lord, if it's really you, let me come to you walking on the water. How many of you know no man has ever walked on the water before? Nor after. He said, Lord, if it's really you, let me come to you on the water. Jesus said one word. He said, come. Peter got down out of the boat, and he began to walk to Jesus. See, the process, listen to this, the process, there's a process, and then there's a process and a what? Circumstances. There's the process, and cir here's the process. The process is to listen to, to Jesus obey, come out of the boat, and begin walking to him. He began to do that, and then he focused on the circumstances, the storm that was brewing, the waves that were coming. And the Bible says that Peter began to sink. But thank God, he had enough sense to focus again on the process, which was the Savior, Jesus. He said, Lord, save me. Jesus reached down and picked him back up. See, it don't matter in the midst of your season. If you're in the process, remain focused on the process. But if you mess up and focus on the circumstances, cry out, say, Lord, help thou mine unbelief so I can get back to the focus. Somebody say amen. amen. Number two, stop thinking logically. I, I, I'm going to, can I admit something right now? Sometimes I just try to figure stuff out too much. Even the way God's going to do things. Has anybody ever, how many of you guys ever try to figure out the way God's going to work something out? 
How many of you guys have had something in your mind the way God's going to do it? Most of the 99.99999 times, it ain't the way you think it's going to be. Let me put another point on there. It don't happen usually the way you think it's going to happen. Stop thinking logical. God's not a logical God. He's just God. Listen to this. Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9. God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your, or than my thoughts than your thoughts. I'm not telling you not to use common sense and wisdom. You need to count the cost, right? That's biblical. But oftentimes, when we're going through seasons in our life, let's just save some time. Save some worry. Save some stress. Stop trying to figure. I'm preaching to myself right now. Stop trying to figure it out and just trust God. My favorite scripture in the entire Bible, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, not on the screen. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. That don't sound like you thinking logically. That sounds like you trust in God, even when you don't know what he's going to do. Number three, view your obedience for the setup as the will of God to bless others. See, anytime God blesses you, it's always to be a blessing to somebody else. Anytime God blesses you, it's always so that you can be a blessing to somebody else. Now, Elijah, who was from Tishbe and Gilead, told Ahab, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. See, God had trusted the man of God to be obedient. And when God spoke to him again, he prayed, And it rained after three and a half years. I don't want to go through the whole story, but the Israelites had walked away from God and began to get involved in in idol worship. They met up on on Mount Carmel. And God challenged the the, the wicked king Ahab. He said, listen, they summons the children of Israel around this mountain. And Elijah said, I want you to get you a bull. I want you to get you a sacrifice. And I want you to put it on the altar with fire. He said, but don't, don't, don't light it yet. Don't light it, just, just get it ready. And I want you to call on your God, little G, fire from heaven. And who's ever God rains down fire from heaven, that's the God that we'll trust. See, God wasn't happy because his babies, Israel, his children had walked away from him. But God used that drought that hadn't had rain in three and a half years, no dew for three and a half years, but God used that situation to bring them back home to bring them back to him. You ever heard of tough love? Has your parents ever taught you some tough love and you didn't like that tough love? You thought they lost their mind. You're like, why in the world hadn't she called me? Why in the world they hadn't come and checked on me? Our mama used to tell us, boy, if you go to jail, don't you call me because I ain't coming to get you. You know what? She never came got me one time. Not one time did my mama ever come get me out of jail. Let me tell you why. I ain't never been to jail a day in my life. And I don't plan on ever going to jail a day in my life. But see, sometimes God shows us. He allows us to be big, bad, and you know how we think we're grown and on our own. We do it, but God shows us that we can't make it without him. So when you walk away from that hedge of protection, when you walk away from under the the will of God, then you become on your own and you get in trouble. What do you do, Lord? Oh, Lord Jesus, help me. And what does he do? He comes running because he loves us unconditionally. But Elijah prayed and rain came. But listen to this. They're up up on this mountain. And he says, who's ever God sends down fire from heaven, we're going to trust that God. So Elijah, I'm, I'm sorry, Ahab and all the prophets, they were praying. Send down fire. I mean, they did it for a long time. And, and after a while, Elijah started messing with them, teasing them. Was your God asleep? Is he hard of hearing? 
That's what the Bible says. God says maybe he's asleep. Scream louder, talk louder, pray louder. Then when it came time for Elijah to do the same thing, Elijah put the, 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 the bull up on there. He put fire, but then he had him dousing it with water, filled a trench with water. And Elijah, the man of God who served and, 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 and trusted in the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he prayed for fire from heaven. And fire came down from heaven and consumed the, the sacrifice, the wood. And the Bible says it licked up all the water that was in the trenches. Then the people said, we will trust the Lord our God. You've been set up in this season of your life. Don't quit before it happens. Four, and I'm done. Know that God will never leave you hanging, even when it seems as though he has. One of the biggest lies Satan tells us is that God has forsaken us. One of the biggest lies that the enemy says to us when we don't feel God, when we feel like our prayers aren't being answered, I want you to know that you're not the only one that prays about something and nothing happens, something don't happen immediately. Maybe not even a week later, maybe not even a month, maybe not even a year later. I've prayed for things and it didn't happen the next year or even the second year. I can't control that. God is in control of that. My assignment is to pray and believe and expect. Pray, believe, and expect. Pray, believe, and expect. Even if things don't go my right. How many of you guys have prayed about something and instead of it getting better, it seemed like it got worse? Those are those moments where the devil says, "Uh uh-huh, you might as well quit. Prayer don't work. Just quit. Give up. If you quit, you miss your setup. You're in a season for a reason. Know that God will never leave you hanging. The devil will tell you, where's this God at? Sometimes in those dark seasons, the devil will tell you that God ain't even real. You've been trusting God. You've been believing God. God, if he was real, why didn't he answer your question? If he was real, why are you going through this? Why does bad things happen to good people if God is so real? God, where are you? God, why is my world crumbling right before me? God, why am I so confused? God, why do I not know where I'm at? God, why am I hurting so bad? God, I've prayed and yet I don't feel you or see you. Just because you don't feel him or see him doesn't mean he's not there. How do you think you're walking? How do you think you're talking? How do you think you're breathing? Man, I, a couple of songs come to my head that we used to sing way back in the day. I don't know what I do without the Lord. I couldn't even take a step without the Lord. I couldn't even breathe this breath without the Lord. Y'all may be too young to know anything about that, but I remember that song from way back in the day. Know that God will never leave you hanging, even when it seems as though he has. And let's just be real. There are times in our life where we feel that we can't even see God. There are times in our life that we feel that we can't even feel God. There are times in our life that we feel that we've been abandoned by the one that promised us that he would never, ever abandon us. Well, I want to serve notice on the devil. He is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Our God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Our God says, I will be with you even unto the end of the earth even to the end of the world. In this season of your life, remain steadfast, remain unshakable, remain unmovable, remain steadfast, remain in your season because you're in your season for a setup. Can I get a witness? Somebody put their hands together. I want to leave you with this scripture right here. Philippians chapter 1, verse number 6. Be confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, he which begun a good work in you will perform it 
until the day of Jesus. In other words, what God started in you, he's going to finish it. <laughs> Let me tell you why. Because God is not a quitter. God doesn't halfway do things. God doesn't start one assignment and he'll quit to go to another assignment. See, what God has started in you, God will finish. Even in those moments where you become weak, even in those moments where you become so confused and so weak and so just messed up, and even when you say, God, where are you? God, you have abandoned me. God, I don't feel you. That doesn't offend God. God is big enough to handle it. See, in those moments that you're worrying about it, those moments that you're discouraged, God's working right along for the setup. Positioning you for the setup. Preparing you for the setup. In those moments where you felt you were all alone, God will use those moments of test to put in your mouth a testimony so that you can tell somebody else, hey, baby, if God did it for me, he will show enough do it for you. Because my God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the God that did it for me is the God that will do it for you. Get ready for the setup. You're on the right track. You're in the right place in your life. Everything may not have worked out the way you planned it. It don't matter. Watch for the ravens. Watch for the ravens. Stay at the brook where God told you to stay. And listen, when the brook dries up, God's going to send you to Zarephath, and there's a widow woman there who's prepared to take care of you. What God has started in you. Go back to that verse, and then I want you to, to, to finish up on this this. Slide right here. Go back to the last verse, Philippians 1, 6. Be confident of this very thing, that he which is God, he that has begun a good work in you, will perform it, will finish it to the day of Jesus. Now, go back to the last slide. Go back to the, um, to the setup. See that finish? You're going to finish you're going to come to a place of completion. It may be something personally with you or your kids, or your family, your business, your ministry, whatever. You're going to finish. Because what God started in you, God's going to finish. What God began in you, God's going to complete it. What God spoke to you, if you remain obedient, he'll bring it to fruition. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we honor you today. We bless your name today simply because you are God. And Lord, we all have to acknowledge that we go through times where we find it difficult. We find it challenging. Sometimes, Father, even to trust you because Lord, we don't always know exactly what needs to be done. Sometimes in our, our carnal our natural way of thinking, Father, we try to figure things out when we just need to trust you and believe you. Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus for every person that's going through a season that may seem like a dry season, that may seem like a drought in their life right now. Lord, help them to recognize that today's word is prophetic, that, Lord God, you're using this to position them for the setup. And what you started in them, you're going to bring to fruition. I want to ask you something this morning. I'm not going to ask you to come to the altar. I want to pray for you right where you are. For those of you that are in a season of your life that's challenging right now, that's difficult right now, and you feel like this word is for you, that God is positioning you for a setup. I'm not going to ask you to come. For, I just want you to stand up right where you are. I want to pray for you right there in your seat. That word's for you. I want you to stand up on your feet.
People are standing up all over the house, all over the house. There may be others. If that word is for you, I want you to stand to your feet. I want you to stand to your feet. You're going through a difficult time in your life. This is unusual. Get ready for the setup. Please don't misunderstand today as being just a good sermon, just a good message, because it's not just a good sermon. It's not just a good message. You heard from God this morning. You've heard from heaven this morning. God is positioning you for the setup. For the, I'm going to say this, for the setup of your life. For the setup of your life. No good thing we withhold from them that love and obey him. God wants to bless you. It delights him to bless you. It delights him to prosper you. Father, in the name of Jesus, every man, every woman that's on their feet right now, May they persevere during this dry season in their life. May they persevere in this dry season in their life, oh God. Father, may they not get caught up with the circumstances, but Lord, may they focus on the process because God, you're in the process. You're in the details. God, you're working it out for your glory and for their good, even though they don't fully understand it, even though they don't like it, oh God, even though they, they may be discouraged right now, they may feel like they've been beat up right now, Father God, it doesn't matter. Because, Father, your word declares that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, oh God, bless your people and bless them indeed in the name of Jesus. May they trust you, Father. May they walk after you like never before, oh God. May they recognize, oh God, that you are there. And you're not going to leave them. And you hadn't left them. In Jesus' name, may they continue, Father, to persevere, to position themselves for the setup. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Here's my, here's, my, here's my next question. You guys can remain, or you guys can take your seats. You guys can take your seats. I don't know everyone that's here. There's some new people visiting today.